But this week we decided to open up the webinar to a general audience as we know there's a great thirst for information about what is happening in Greece and how the crisis is likely to play out in the days ahead. Now if you're accessing the webinar via the GoToMeeting uh, technology platform that we use, you're going to be able to view some of the, uh, uh, the slides that have been prepared by our featured guest, Aristides Hassis. You'll also be able to type your questions in uh, to where it says chat on the right-hand side of the GoToWebinar control panel. Those questions will be going directly to me, and I'll do my best to integrate those questions into the question and answer period that will follow the formal presentation. I'm now going to turn the program over to my Atlas Network colleague, Alexander Skouros. Um, he has been coordinating our team's efforts with our local partners in Greece. It was about six weeks ago that we co-hosted, along with the Cato Institute and local partners, an emergency economic summit in Athens. And that program attracted a lot of attention, and it was very much the vision of Alexander Skouros, who then brought it to fruition with great help as well from our board member, Nikos Monios. So to tell you a little bit about that effort and to, inter and to introduce our program's feature speaker, I'd like to pass it now to Alexander Skouros. Thank you very much, Brad. Greetings, everybody. It's a real honor to be uh, addressing uh, this audience of select Atlas Network partners uh, and friends and supporters. Um, we have, it is a great honor also for me to be uh, hosting Professor Aristides Hadzis, who is who has been the leading voice of pro-reform and economic sanity uh, in the country where I come from, also Greece. Uh, and he was also gracious enough to address the Emergency Economic Summit that we put together with the Cato Institute, uh, the Greek Liberal Monitor, uh, our Greek partner, and the Liberty Forum of Greece, another Greek partner as well, uh, in order to stress the necessity for the Greek economy to reform itself, to do structural reforms instead of constantly increasing taxes and prolonging the, the economic crisis that struck in 2009. Unfortunately, uh, over the past days, uh, there have been many dramatic changes in the, the prospects and the ability of Greece uh, to go down the path of reform. And for that reason, I thought that, and everyone here at Atlas thought that it would be a great idea if we could get the leading expert on the topic, Professor Hadzis, to inform uh, our friends and our partners. Um, let me t tell you a little bit about the speaker you're about to hear. Uh, Professor Hadzis uh, has been one of the, mo the most sought out intellectuals for nearly every major international news agency um, over the past years. He has been featured at uh, the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal. He has given interviews even up until a few moments ago. Uh, he was giving an interview at Voice of America. Yesterday he was at BBC and was also broadcasted here in the U.S. Um, uh, through uh, an American radio station. And in addition to that, um, he has been on the right side of, as far as his predictions are concerned, about what will happen to Greece if it won't reform. Um, he completed his basic, his basic legal studies at uh, the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. He studied sociology, philosophy, history, and economic analysis of law at the graduate level at the Aristotle University again, and at the University of Chicago at the law school. In 1999, he received his doctorate on, on economics of law under the supervision of uh, Judge Richard Posner, Frank Easterbrook, and William Landis. He is an attorney at law and a member of the Thessaloniki Bar Association since 1992 and of the American Bar Association since 1994. He also, uh, in 2001, was elected a member of the steering committee of the European Association of Law and Economics, where he served until 2006. He is a member of the advisory board of the Society of European Contract Law, the steering committee of the European Network for a Better Regulation, and the editorial bo board of European Review of Contract Law. He's also a fellow at the, of the European Law Institute and a member of the scientific board of the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy. 
In early 2014, he was appointed to the National Council for Research and Technology, the Supreme Advisory Board of the Greek government for the formulation of research, technology, and innovation policy. He has uh, been the recipient of several, several fellowships and awards, and his papers have been published in major international journals and in international collective volumes. He has uh, refereed papers for over 20 journals, and he has taught as visiting professor in several Greek, European, and North American universities. He is the co-editor co of Law and Economics, Philosophical Issues, and Fundamental Questions, which was published by Rutledge in 2015. Uh, and he is the founder of two of uh, the most invigorating, most, most powerful Greek uh, partners that we I ha I've had the honor to work with, um, the John Stuart Mill Research Group and LearnLiberty.gr. Also, um, he is the founder of GreekCrisis.net, which is one of the most important blogs that uh, cover the Greek crisis since its beginning. So uh, I want to tell you that as far as uh, the Atlas Network's activities in Greece are concerned, we have been very supportive of all the pro-reform classical liberals that we were able to identify over the past two years, and we have seen substantial progress, especially when it comes to young students. Uh, young students and our partners were leading over the past few weeks uh, efforts in order to stress the need for Greece to reform instead of leaving the Europe, the European Union, leaving the Euro, uh, or uh, defaulting, on, defaulting on its debt. Uh, there are people in Greece who believe that through reforms and free markets, uh, we the country uh, has a better future in front of it. However, that's not the case when it comes to uh, the current government or the previous one for that matter. In order to answer all your questions, therefore, regarding what's happening in Greece. Uh, I have the honor to introduce Professor Aristides Katsis, who will begin his presentation right now. OK. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to, to thank the Atlas Network, and particularly my friend and comrade, Alexandros Kouras, who had the idea and organized this webinar. I, I also want to thank uh, Tom Palmer because he's uh, so instrumental in everything that has to do with the, uh, the freedom and liberty in the world. And of course, you, my listeners, uh, from Greece, Europe, the United States, and uh, other countries and continents. I appreciate the fact that uh, you're going to spend an hour trying to decipher what I'm going to say since my accent, as you can hear, it's. Uh, it is totally Greek. OK, the objective of this webinar is to offer uh, a broad overview of the current situation in Greece, and then to discuss possible solutions. Uh, not so much discussing solutions as uh, pointing uh, to, the, uh, to the causes of the problems. And if we find the cause, then we can cure the problem. I mean, this is the only way to cure a problem, by finding the cause first. Um, I'm here to, to tell you a story, a story of how we got here, how modern Greece became the symbol of economic and political patriarchy, especially today, especially after 1 a.m. last night. I believe that I'm the right person to narrate this story, because my area of expertise is the economic analysis of institutions, and this is problem is first and foremost an institutional problem. As we uh, were going to see, Greece is like a natural experiment of an institutional failure, because um, it is difficult for a single country to be, uh, let's say, a textbook example for many, so, so many uh, institutional deficiencies, rigidities, and distortions, as Greece is. Uh, I think that I don't think I don't think that uh, anybody can copy any other country can copy Greece's uniqueness in this respect, in the combination of almost every problem. However, the case of Greece is interesting and educational, as a precautionary tale for all the other countries. It is because I believe that it is difficult to to fail as miserable as Greece has. In the, for the past 30 years, but it is a very, it's very easy to fail in the same way. Greece uh, used to be 
success story. Actually, I try to to change the slide. Okay, uh, I think that the, uh, the slide was changed. Okay, yes. Okay, Greece used to be a success uh, story uh, with sound economic policies. As you can see, at this table, actually, this is one of the first tables that I have seen in the first uh, economics textbook that I bought in Athens. Some I don't know. 20 years ago, or no, no 20, more than 30 years ago. Um, in this uh, table, you can see that Greece was not only a success story, it was the success story. Its average annual rate of growth, of, that is of real GMP per capita, was first in the world for a period of more than 50 years, from 1929 to 1980. Greece's average rate of growth for half a century was 5.2% uh, percent, with Japan coming second with only 4.9%. Uh, uh, you will notice that in the right hand column of, on the, of, of the table there is another column that uh, is marked uh, doubling time. That gives the number of years that it takes for real income per capita to double for each country. For this the doubling time was only 14 years. These numbers are more impressive if uh, we take into consideration the fact that the political situation in Greece during these years, these 50 years, was anything but normal. Uh, only in July 1974, Greece became a constitutional liberal democracy before Greece managed to, uh, to become a phenomenon of growth among wars, insurgencies, dictatorships and uh, civil wars and an anomalous political life. As you can see in this table, only six of the, of the normal years, from 1974 to 1980, are represented here. Seven years uh, later, the nine then members of the European communities accepted Greece as the tenth member, even before Spain and Portugal. It was mostly a political decision, but it was also a decision based on 50 years of an interrupted economic growth despite all the setbacks. When Greece entered the European communities, the public debt was only 28% of GDP, the deficit less than 3%, and the unemployment 2 to 3%. The only problem, of course, was the, a very high inflation rate of 25%, uh, 25% that, of course, it was due to the second oil crisis, to, the, to both uh, oil crises. So Greece became a member of the European uh, Community in uh, uh, January of 1981. Ten months later, in October of 1981, the Socialist Party of Andreas of Andreu came to power with a radical leftist agenda, including exiting the European Community. Of course, nobody was so stupid as to realize such a promise. Greece would pass off in power, stayed in the European Communities, but managed to reverse the trend in only uh, uh, in only a few years. The funny thing was that, uh, I mean, the historical uh, tragedy that uh, he, it was uh, his son, Andreas of Andreu's son, Joseph Andreu, who signed the first bailout agreement in 2010. And he, I mean, with this agreement, he tried to destroy almost uh, everything from his uh, father's legacy. From 1921 to 2010-2011, uh, the days of the first and the second bailout, we have 30 years of getting subsidies from the European Union, borrowing and spending. In these years we had minimal structural reforms and anti-market buyer. The state control about 75% of all business assets and the bloated welfare state. We're going to, to say a lot of things about this bloated uh, welfare state. Uh, you can see, I mean, this road to, uh, to let's say, to perdition um, brought a borrowed happiness to Greece, borrowed in the sense that this was not a sound uh, happiness based 
on wealth created by the markets, but it was uh, welfare based on loans and subsidies. So the average per capita income in 2008 of the average Greek, uh, Greek was $31,700. Uh, uh, it was the 25th in the world, 95% of the EU average. The private spending was 12% more than the European Union average. And it is also characteristic that in the human development and quality of life uh, indices, Greece fare even better. It was uh, one of the richest countries in the world. It had the uh, 22nd place in the world. You can see here some numbers that are very distressing. Uh, as you can see, in 1980, the public debt was only 28%, as we said before. In 10 years, the public debt reached 89%. These 10 years, PASOK was dominating uh, the Greek uh, political life. Uh, so as you can see in this, uh, in this table with these numbers, uh, the degradation of this today is mainly the result of PASOK's policies in two important respects. First of all, PASOK's actual economic policy was catastrophic since it led to a deadly mix of a giant, uh, gigantic and at the same time inefficient welfare state and overregulation. And the second thing was that the political legacy of PASOK was even more devastating in the long term since its political success transformed the Greek Conservative Party, the New Democracy, to a bad copy of PASOK, a PASOK number two. Both parties were for the most part of the period from 1981 to 2009 typical examples of welfare populism, cronism, statism, nepotism, protectionism, paternalism, everything. And they still are. So the, the, the dreadful uh, result was not monopolized by PASOK, but it was the outcome of a disastrous competition in welfare populism and overregulation. Um, as we can see, the public deficit from the 3%, less than 3% in 1980, reached 15.4% a few months before the first bailout. Uh, this is a, a, a graph in Greek, but you can understand it's the number of Greek public servants and the way that uh, the Greek public service, the, the Greek uh, public administration was bloated from 1974 to 2010. Uh, I suppose that you will find this uh, graph much easier to understand. It's the number of civil, civil servants again from 1974 to 2010. This is you can see, I mean, the construction of the Greek bureaucracy, of the Greek clientelist state. Uh, you can also uh, see the the, uh, the correlation with the with the electoral uh, cycle in Greece, and of course, this led to a great and rapid increase of the Greek public debt. You can see the uh, this road from uh, the from 1980, where the Greek public debt was extremely low, to 2010 and 2011. And uh, in this graph, you can see the way the increase of the uh, of the Greek public debt uh, in the ten in the decade before the first bailout agreement, before the beginning of the Greek. Uh, crisis. Uh, the man responsible for this, uh, for the last phase of the Greek party, was unfortunately Kostas Karamalis, the nephew of the old, of the uh, Konstantinos Karamalis. Konstantinos Karamalis, his uh, uncle, was one of the. He, he was a major Greek politician uh, after the war. He was instrumental in. Uh, putting Greece into the European Union. However, his uh, nephew, uh, as you can see in this graph, which is again in Greek, but I, I, I believe that everyone can understand it, um, he was the most proud uh, pupil of Andreas of Andreu, 
even though he had exactly the same name with his uncle. So Greece in 2010, uh, a public debt of 143 almost uh, percent of GDP, a public deficit of more than 15 percent. And uh, as you know, these numbers were fudged and now, I mean, now uh, we know the correct numbers, but in 2010 even these numbers were very controversial and there was no growth in 2010. Uh, it was the beginning of the recession. I think that this particular um, uh, graph shows more than anything else the nature of the Greek tragedy. One of the problems is not so much, was not so much the unemployment rate, but the very low employment rate. In Greece, the employment rate is less than 50%. More than one third of the youth labor force was uh, unemployed in the beginning of the crisis. Now it's more than 60%. The estimate, estimated size of the unreported economy, according to this graph, is 25%. There are different reports that, uh, uh, I mean, some of these reports say that this uh, unreported economy is 20 to 25 percent, but there are also reports and papers that uh, argue for an even greater number. And please, I'd like to, uh, to ask for your attention for the last part of the graph. The Greek government spent nearly half of its budget on social benefits, 42 percent. They spent like 10,000, the Greek government spent like 10,600 uh, euros per person when they earned, uh, the Greek government earned 8,300 uh, uh, euros per person in taxes and that uh, left a 2,300 uh, euros deficit per person. And of course uh, we have, we had this and we still have this extremely bloated uh, welfare state. These numbers are, ca um, I mean, uh, most of these numbers are coming from a book by a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, Manos Mataganis, uh, who wrote an excellent book about the Greek uh, uh, welfare state. Again, this is a, a, the textbook example. Um, as you can see, the social benefits to households as a percent of the GDP uh, during the last uh, tenure of uh, the conservative government of Kostas Karamalis reached from 22 percent to, uh, to 29 percent in uh, five years, seven percent. Um, half of them went to pensions, social transfers that, that is subsidies to the pension funds of, of the powerful professional groups equal then 52 percent of this half. And in 2009, Right before the uh, the start of the of the recession, uh, according to the European uh, Union uh, pension projections, the the retirement system of Greece looked like a nightmare. I mean, according to these projections, in 2060, uh, almost a quarter of Greek GDP uh, should go to uh, to to pensions, to retirement benefits. As you can see, uh, Greece in 2012, two years after the first bailout, was the first in pension spending in uh, the European Union, according to, to Eurostat. And you can see here another graph uh, with pension expenditures and the comparison with the Eurozone and Germany. And now you can understand why Germans are so angry at us if uh, they see, I mean, graphs like that. Um, could you please uh, spend some, uh, not minutes, seconds, <laughs> observing this particular graph. This, is, this graph is very interesting because you can see the social benefits paid by government as a percent of GDP uh, from 1999 to 2009. I mean, this graph compares these two years. As you can see, the countries, and first of all Greece, that had a rising share of uh, social benefits as a percent of GDP, 
were the countries that had to deal with uh, a crisis that was more ferocious than uh, for the other European countries after 2008. Greece, again, is the textbook example, but also Portugal, Ireland, Spain, etc., the so-called pigs. Uh, this is another Greek graph uh, that uh, has to do uh, with the uh, with the percentage of uh, of GDP that is going to to social transfers, uh, and you can see uh, the uh, the blue uh, line is the Greek one, blue or green, de depending on the, on your monitor. It's the Greek line, and the orange line is uh, the average of the European uh, Union. Uh, you can see the trend, but also you can see uh, an indicator that is an indicator of efficiency of public spending. Uh, the indicator, it was, I mean, and this indicator depends, I mean, is, um, is based on uh, eradicating poverty on the, on, let's say, on the points of, uh, of decrease in poverty. So uh, the European Union had an average of eight. Greece had only an average of two. And Ireland, which is uh, one of the most efficient uh, welfare states in, uh, in Europe, had an efficiency indicator of 11. Uh, for example, in 2002, uh, no, in 2004, the indicator of the efficiency of social benefits in Europe was 13%. Uh, in uh, yeah, the European uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Greek uh, number. The, the Greek indicator was 13 percent when the the European Union average was 35 percent, and there were some Scandinavian countries that were so efficient in eradicating poverty with the same amount of money uh, as 70 percent. In 2002, the situation for Greece was even worse. The indicator was a poor 4 percent, with an average of 31 percent. For the uh, for the European Union. Now, look at this graph because this graph is disgraceful for Greece. This graph was very popular at the summit, as you might remember. Uh, it is disgraceful not only uh, for Greece, as you can see, but for uh, I mean, most certainly for Greece. As late as 2011. The highest quantile in Greece received more than three times in social benefits than the lowest quantile. To put it simply, the Greek welfare state, the Greek welfare populism, were covers a disguise for a huge redistribution for the benefit of the economically and politically powerful. As we can see, uh, people in Greece that belong to the highest quantile took in social benefits more than three times, three times more than the uh, people in the lowest quantile. Who got this money? I mean, the cronies, of course, because these benefits were the award for rent-seeking activities. Greece, I mean, if we, we want to put Greece to place it in a theoretical framework. And th I think that the best framework is offered by a recent book by uh, Daron Ademoglu and James Robinson, Why Nations Fail. Uh, the two authors are emphasizing the importance of institutions. Uh, this is a typical case of a, of a country with extractive institutions. Extractive that is designed by the politically powerful elites to extract resources from the rest of society. This is the Greek institutional uh, trap, a bloated inefficient welfare state with tax evasion, which is considered a social right, a huge inefficient public sector, corruption. As you notice, I didn't say anything about corruption or tax evasion, because I suppose that everyone now in, uh, globally knows all the, the ugly details. Corruption, which is essentially uh, tolerated, if not decriminalized, because uh, the, the tolerance to corruption in Greece is extremely high, even now. Public sector union power, closed professions, and over-regulation uh, to ensure rent 
seeking. This is a state that was made for the welfare of politically powerful press groups. These extractive institutions are also obvious in the quality of rule of law, in the protection of the property rights. It is a state that it was made, that it was tailored for public sector employees. It is characteristic that now we have almost more than uh, we have more than 1.5 uh, billion, not billion, sorry, million <laughs> unemployed people in Greece. 98, 99 percent of them coming from the private sector, and less than 10 percent of them are receiving any kind of unemployment benefits. Of course, this this kind of country is a country without trust. I'm not going to elaborate on this. It is a country with a political culture of statism, protectionism, corruption, cronies, nepotism, rent-seeking, irresponsible spending. And this led to the two bailouts in 2010 and 2012. These bailouts led to a recession, a very ugly recession. And you can see the, this very informative graph, the worst recession in the European Union, the worst recession among the countries that went into recession, and they had problems during this uh, European sovereign debt crisis. Uh, you can see some very informative graphs, not only for GDP, but also for um, uh, the unemployed, uh, the number of unemployed, uh, of unemployed people. As you can see, the investment, instead of going up, uh, and as we're going to see, Everybody waited for the for direct investment to to increase because of the of the decrease in labor cost. However, uh, the opposite happened. Um, the unemployment rate was worse than every other country that it was a part of this uh, sovereign crisis uh, problem. The people which are risk uh, of poverty. Or social who are uh, at the risk of poverty or social exclusion in Greece as a percentage, percentage of population are more than any, uh, any other country of the Eurozone. This is again a Greek uh, graph, but it is very, uh, it's very easy to understand it. It's the fall of demand, the fall, uh, the fall of demand for supermarket products from 2010 to 2014. It is interesting that for a year, uh, the reaction of the Greek population was not exactly rational. Uh, I mean, it was not exactly rational because uh, despite the cutbacks, I mean, there was a slight increase in demand, but then they realized that there is a crisis. Uh, here you can see that uh, most of this money from the bailouts didn't go to, uh, to the Greek people. They went to the, to the banks for recapitalization to the Greek banks or to the creditors. 27% uh, of this uh, money went to, to the Greek state, to the Greek government. And there was also some minor um, amounts for other purposes. However, the Greek debt is not the problem right now. Uh, as you can see in the second graph, uh, servicing the debt is not a problem right now. Uh, it is characteristic that the Greece's interest payments are a lot lower than uh, the payments from other debtor states. As you can see, I mean, uh, the, the, for example, the interest rate that Greece is paying is extremely low. It's as low as the interest rate that strong economies like France or especially Germany are paying. However, the most the worst thing was, as I mentioned before, was that despite this crisis, there was no uh, improvement in competitiveness. Uh, this improvement is more that you can see in this graph, this supposed uh, improvement, it was based on labor cost and it was a mirage. I mean, because the labor cost, as I said, uh, dropped very steeply. However, there were no uh, investments in Greece. Not only there were not investments, but we had a tremendous 
uh, brain drain that led to a kind of, an, of, of a national catastrophe. I mean, a brain drain of reaching more than 200,000 uh, young people who left Greece. Uh, and the people, the young people that remain in Greece, most of them are unemployed. However, there was some very tiny positive indicators at the end of 2014, right before Syriza came to power. Why, despite, I mean, these austerity measures, tax hikes, some spending cuts, uh, this and the, the steep uh, decline of labor costs, there were no investments, because Greece is not a free market economy. Greece is characterized as mostly unfree by almost every ranking uh, you can find. I mean, of course, in the Index of Economic Freedom, the Economic Freedom of the World by the Fraser Institution, in the Global Competitive uh, Report. I mean, as you can see, there is a pattern here. Greece is always the last in the European Union, and not only the last in the European Union, and, but w one of the, of the less free economies in the European continent. This is our neighborhood. Can you spot this? I, I, there is a delay. Okay, now I think that everybody can see this, this uh, graph. Please spot this. <laughs> it's between uh, Bangladesh and India. It's uh, very close to Ni no, uh, I mean Niger is much better than Mozambique and even Egypt. As you can also see, Greece is characterized as mostly unfree. Uh, this is another graph from uh, the uh, a table from doing business. Uh, this graph is very illustrative because, according to this graph, I mean, as we can see, the amount of time that you need to enforce a contract in uh, Greece, 1,300 days, I mean, it's, uh, uh, I don't know, it's a joke, as we can see, the OECD uh, uh, average, high income average, is uh, one third, a little bit than one third. Um, has enforcing contracts became uh, become easier over time? I mean, from at least from 2010, no. This is another very uh, useful table. Uh, in this table, you can find a list of all the reforms that the Greek government, the the Greek government, uh, the Greek government, the previous governments, the governments of the bailouts, uh, has uh, passed and enforced. As you can see, despite the many reforms, there was no improvement. And this is another uh, very interesting again table, the uh, the easiness about the easiness of resolving insolvency bankruptcy. As we can see, Greece sucks not only in enforcing a contract but also in resolving a bankruptcy. This means, <laughs> I mean, essentially that in Greece it's extremely difficult for a contractual relationship. Uh, for a, for a business, I mean, to it, it, its birth is difficult, and at the same time, its death is also difficult. I mean, Greek businesses do not bankrupt; they become zombies. Um, of course, uh, the explanation is quite reasonable. It's the Greek political system we described before the extractive institutions. Uh, the Greek politicians are textbook examples for the public uh, choice uh, school. Uh, I think that these two American cartoons are very suitable here and they can be used for uh, Greek purposes. The cost of this uh, inefficiency of this rent seeking, it was estimated from 17 to 25 uh, billion uh, euros by two colleagues of mine uh, in 2011 in one of the best books about the Greek crisis. The overregulation in Greece is absolutely crazy. One more, almost, I mean, 200,000 regulations from 1974 to 2015. I mean, I suppose that uh, since 2005, 
I don't know how many regulations have been added up. And this is another graph that is in BAIC, but it is very a very useful graph, and it is also a shameless uh, promotion for the uh, for our uh, land liberty side that Alexandros, and Georgos, and Yuli are uh, administering. I mean, this is one of the of the few half baked reforms that the Greek uh, bailout government managed to enforce the the regulation of the book market. This led to an unprecedented decline in prices, 40%. The funny thing is that the bookstore that offered the best discount, it was a Marxist bookstore. And this Marxist bookstore, the owner of the bookstores, the owners are friends of mine. And they were sounding at me, I mean, is this a capitalist economy? I mean, we are offering now a 40% discount, and the Syriza government is going to cancel this half-baked reform. They are, I mean, they are mad because they offered as a bookstore. I'm repeating this as many times. I mean, <laughs> as possible in every lecture, uh, the books fall. The price of the books fell by 40%. And according to the new prime minister of civil civilization, don't I mean, I, I do not want to comment about the title. Uh, the, prime, the, the Minister of Civilization, according to him, nobody benefited from the deregulation. Hello, the consumers, my students, who are paying now 40% less when they go to this Marxist bookstore and they find extremely cheap books. This is a land liberty GR graph. And of course, we have now, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Yuli is thanking me that the yeah, Ministry of Culture, not of Civilization. Yeah, I, mean, I was confused with it. Uh, we have now a Luddite government, a leftist government, a radical leftist government. Uh, I'm only going to mention that even though, I mean, there is such a, uh, a ferocious unemployment in Greece with 26, 27 percent of Greeks being unemployed, more than 60 percent of young people are unemployed. And this government, is seriously thinking of raising the minimum wage in Greece as uh, a way of solving the unemployment problem. Uh, I suppose that everyone is familiar with the, the way that the Greek uh, uh, government is negotiating right now, especially at this particular moment. The Greek uh, government tried uh, to, to find, to uh, to, to, to create new alliances with uh, countries like Russia, they failed there too. And the negotiation came to an impasse where the Greek government decided to go to a referendum. Uh, the most important point, the most important problem of these negotiations was the, was the, the, the retirement system uh, reforms. Uh, here you can find another uh, table in Greek. Uh, it's the table of Greek pensioners. The first, the first uh, column is about uh, their age, as you can see. The second is the number of uh, pensioners. The third, the average amount of money that the government uh, pays. And the fourth column is the average income from uh, pensions. As you can see, there are a lot of people in Greece who are pensioners and uh, younger than uh, 60 years old. Actually, the average uh, age of the public sector employees is only 55. I know that for the Americans, this is not so, um, for, for the American uh, friends in the audience, it's not so impressive because in the United States, I mean, in a sense, you can choose your own uh, uh, age. However, for Europe, these numbers are, I mean, uh, crazy. And this is the Greek proposal uh, for the uh, reform of the retirement system. As you can see, I mean, <laughs> the Greek government uh, protects the gray area, the gray zone, the public uh, sector employees again. And the problem now with the, the hard default that we had yesterday, it was a hard default because this was not the same thing as the default in 2010. It was a soft default then because there was a bailout agreement and because there were sources of funding. Now there are no sources of funding 
so this is a hard default and it is a hard default towards IMF the worst default possible nobody I mean not nobody actually there is a um, there is a and, and this is the Greek uh, government uh, very happy about the referendum decision you, you know the, the, the sad thing is that this was not unprecedented there, there are 300, uh, three, three countries who have already defaulted uh, in uh, uh, with uh, their IMF uh, loans Zambia Zimbabwe and Iraq uh, what's the plan of the Greek government I think that this cartoon Greek cartoon is uh, exactly on the spot it is a kind of a suicide bombing with the, uh, the hope that this attempt attempts many attempts of suicide bombing will be uh, a threat for our partners so to wrap up Greece is badly and urgently needs regulatory reform taxation reform welfare reform and institutional reform the most important thing the only conclusion the most important conclusion more markets freer markets deregulate the, the Greek market because Greeks have an entrepreneurial spirit from the ancient times only a freer economy can lead to more growth and to more jobs thank you very much well, thank you very much, Aristides. Uh, this is a very educational uh, uh, presentation. Um, we have uh, received some, some questions that I'll post to you in just one second, but I'll remind our listeners that you can also um, add your voice to the conversation by entering your questions under the, um, the, the chat uh, little box in the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, uh, let me just uh, start off by, by asking you, you know, what do you think is going to unfold in, in, you know, the, in the week ahead with the referendum? Um, in, in a month's time, will uh, Greece still be in the Eurozone? Um, I'm rather optimistic today because according to my inside information, uh, the, uh, the polls are indicating uh, that uh, in Sunday there's going to be um, a victory for the yes uh, for the yes ballot actually there are, I mean this is another thing there is only one ballot even though this is a referendum and this is outrageous I mean uh, it was um, also criticized by the Council of Europe I mean there is going to be only one ballot uh, a ballot that uh, that has no before the yes I mean this is institutionally outrageous anyway uh, I I hope that uh, yes is going to win however independently of any result next week will be extremely difficult for the Greek people because there is going to be no liquidity the Greek banks won't open on Tuesday there's no way to open I mean even after uh, the uh, victory of yes because even then uh, probably Alex Tsipras, the Greek Prime Minister, will resign as he promised yesterday or, or the day before yesterday. He is going to resign and then we have uh, the procedure for uh, forming a new government, probably a coalition, a national unity government of special purpose and this purpose will be to strike a deal, to compromise with mm -hmm. our creditors, with our partners. And this is the optimistic scenario. The pessimistic scenario is for the no vote to win and then there is a great chance, especially if there is no agreement, I mean, in the first week, the Greek government will go to drachma. But, uh, I mean, if the difference between the no vote and the yes vote, in the case that the no uh, prevails, if the difference is very small, that could be uh, a great obstacle for the Greek government because the majority of Greek, uh, of Greek and a lot of them that they are going to pay for no, they believe, uh, they trust the Greek Prime Minister that he is uh, honest. I mean, when he says that he is not, I mean, that, that there is no chance for him to go for, uh, for the drachma, that he is honest and he, he is telling the truth. Hmm. Now, let me ask you well, one interesting question that came in. Um, it goes like this. Um, 
certain that many of us who believe in economic freedom don't exactly trust the European Union to help Greece return to a path of, path of growth. The EU is rather a source of overregulation and bureaucracy. Why would you, as a proponent of economic freedom, want Greece to stay within Europe? You know, could they learn their lessons faster and perform themselves better alone if they were forced under the job? Uh, okay, yeah, I can understand uh, this. There is some truth in this. There is some truth in the sense that, uh, I mean, actually, European Union is not so bureaucratic as uh, as we think. It is characteristic that the numbers, uh, the, the number of employees for the European Union uh, in Brussels are less uh, than the number of employees for the municipality of Birmingham in the United Kingdom. So it's not so bureaucratic. However, there is a source of overregulation. I mean, I agree with the argument. There is another thing. I mean, my argument is that Greece is so much worse than the average in the European Union that by staying in the European Union can only improve itself by trying to reach the European Union average. To Criticize the European Union from the Greek perspective is a, a libertarian luxury, let's say. It's a libertarian luxury because uh, the European Union for the past 20, 30 years was, for Greek standards, a, an extremely libertarian um, paragon in Greek life. That is why I believe that, I mean, from the time being, the influence of the European Union is beneficial towards uh, the Greek state. If Greece is left alone, then it will be a nightmare of socialism, bureaucracy, and everything that is uh, radically left. I mean, for these people, for example, in Syriza, for a lot of them, their model is Venezuela or Cuba. For a lot of them. I mean, they have... Uh, in their uh, uh, ministries, in their offices, in their ministries, they have pictures of uh, uh, of uh, Fidel Castro and uh, not uh, and Chavez and Che Guevara. I mean, that is why I'm saying that the European Union is a great improvement to this. <laughs> yes. Uh, here's another question that came in. Uh, you had you'd mentioned Russia in passing. Um, but, uh, so it's kind of interesting that this question asks on you, if Greece exits the euro, what are the odds that Putin tries to fill the vacuum, and what are the risks if he does? I guess maybe you could even extend that, not just to Putin, but to some of these regimes. Um, I guess the Venezuelans are not in the state to help anybody these days, but uh, yes, essentially right. unfriendly regimes to freedom. Exactly. Uh, the problem is that, uh, of course, Putin and Russia is a kind of a rogue state. However, they are not stupid. They are not going to adapt a failed state with such a huge uh, debt, a state that is going to be untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if someone follows very closely uh, the, the attempts by the Greek government to establish some ties with the uh, Russian Federation, uh, he or she will realize that this led to a failure. I mean, because Russians are very reluctant especially at this period, which is extremely difficult for Russia, not only political but also economically, they were very reluctant to adapt. So uh, for the past, it, it is a characteristic for, for the past uh, one or two weeks, Russia, together with China and the United States, are trying to, uh, to, 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 to persuade the Greek government to strike a deal with the European uh, partners. Mm -hmm. Now, another question to pose to you. Um, in the case of a relatively even vote on Sunday, what's the likelihood that there could be um, sort of mass unrest with the country divided? What's the likelihood of even a civil war? This is the worst consequence. This is going to, uh, to be the worst uh, consequence of this uh, ugly referendum. I'm saying that it's ugly not because it is uh, institutionally outrageous, as I, as I said before, but because it is essentially a bogus refer uh, referendum, a referendum with, uh, with a fandom uh, object, without object, actually. Uh, there is no proposal uh, for the Greek people to vote yes or no. I mean, this was one of the, of the previous drafts that, uh, that uh, our partners sent us. 
I mean, this is, the whole story is ridiculous, and this is definitely going to lead to to a great divide in Greek society, and this is most unfortunate. Mm -hmm. I'll just uh, mention to our listeners that um, oh, we're going to extend the, the webinar for another uh, 10 minutes or so so we can get to a few more of your questions. Uh, one question uh, that came in uh, is, can Greece establish a parallel currency within Greece without dropping out of the Eurozone? As you know, uh, there is no experience on these things, so uh, I'm not an expert on monetary economics. So. I cannot give you an authoritative answer. However, I'm reading a lot, and according to all the experts, this is going to be extremely difficult uh, economically and financially to have uh, a double currency, uh, euros and drachmas, or euros and the promise to pay an IOU, thing, a thing like that. Uh, this is going to create, and there is already, a high level of uncertainty in Greek people. Uh, the black market will cover everything. Uh, I mean, and euros are going to become uh, a precious uh, commodity instead of a currency. I mean, I think that this is going to be a great mistake. Not only economically, I can, pre I can predict the political consequences. The political consequences of such a move will uh, be uh, equal to uh, to a Brexit, mm -hmm. to, a, to one and only currency, to drachma, drachma or whatever its name would be. Yeah. Now, if um, Alexis Tsipras uh, does leave power in the wake of a, a yes vote, um, what happens with the uh, with Syriza? Who represents them, and, and how involved would they be in whatever process takes place next to establish new leadership? Okay, uh, after uh, a defeat, after a yes vote, after the victory of the yes vote, uh, Tsipras will resign, of course. He said that, so I, um, I suppose that he didn't lie. He's going to resign, and then the President of the Republic will try to form a new government. However, any new government, any uh, coalition government should be supported by Syriza because there is no way for the government uh, to have uh, a majority in the parliament without the support of Syriza because Syriza has 149 uh, members of parliament out of 300. Mm -hmm. So uh, the responsible thing for Tsipras is to support this government and help forming this government. However, he's not so good in responsible behavior. He's, uh, I mean, our experience now is rather uh, disheartening. So we have to wait to see if he's going to, uh, and I, I suppose that his behavior will depend on the, uh, the margins, on the gap between the victorious yes, in case that uh, there is a, a yes victory, on the gap between in the, uh, yeah, the gap between uh, yes and no. If uh, the victory of yes is a kind of a even small landslide, like 58% or 60%, I think that this can teach him a lesson and can make him more humble and more responsible. Mm -hmm. Uh, one question that just uh, came in, just to, to clarify, does a no vote mean that Greece will be out of the Eurozone, or is there any chance that a no vote would allow them an opportunity to okay. Not necessarily. However, uh, the chances of, of Brexit will increase so much. I mean, uh, with a no vote, it would be extremely difficult for the Greek government to strike any kind of deal, because any deal that it is still possible, it's a deal that is very close to the deal that the Greek people as supposedly uh, are going to decline now. Uh, so the Greek government will realize very soon that either uh, it should uh, succumb to the, uh, to, to, to the various proposals of our creditors or to find that, uh, to, 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 to enforce the plan B, that is to go to Brexit, to go to a new currency. 
of course, this, I mean, this, uh, especially the transitory period, will be extremely ugly. And um, I guess uh, another uh, very relevant question that's coming from our listeners, uh, where do you see the opportunity for the, the political will to, to build to undertake um, the, the four reforms that you laid out in your presentation, um, or, or even just what would maybe necessary as a, as a compromise to, you know, to actually implement what's ever necessary to stay within the Eurozone? Actually, there is no political will. Uh, the, uh, the previously major parties, New Democracy and PASOK, managed to enforce, uh, for example, in the first bailout, only 80% eight, sorry, eight percent of the reforms that were listed there. And the new conserv the conservative government of Andoni Samaras, uh, I mean, the only reforms that he can be proud of are some half-baked reforms, most of them um, enforced by one or two members of his government who were more liberal, liberal in the European sense of the word, more market-friendly, like uh, Kyriakos Mitsotakis or Kostas Hadzidakis. Hadzidakis was the one who deregulated uh, the book market and he was also in the previous government the, the only uh, minister who managed to push for a major privatization of the Olympic Airways. So I don't see, I mean, the reformers out there uh, waiting for, uh, you know, to be members in a government and uh, push for the reforms. How, however, yeah, after all this, this mess, I mean, I strongly believe that a lot of people, not only in, uh, in, the, in the two ma previously major parties, but also in other parties, like Potami and the small libertarian parties, are going to, uh, to try to find a way to be more involved in Greek politics and do whatever is necessary for these reforms to go forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, and from our perspective here at Atlas, uh, where we sort of keep our, our eye on the, the long-term game, I think that one of the things that's encouraging is that we, we do see more partners, more civil society engaged in, in these arguments. Um, back before Margaret Thatcher was elected in 1979, the man who headed the, the free market think tank that Atlas uh, really used as a, a model in, in, in London uh, wrote a column that said, cheer up, things are getting worse, because he believed that things had to get worse before real solutions mm -hmm. would come to the exactly. fore. And we it, certainly was don't the wish. it was the winter of discontent before <laughs> Margaret Thatcher uh, yes. comes to power. Yes, yeah, so we, we can hope that perhaps the, the trials that Greece is undertaking now will uh, alert more people to the kinds of solutions that you've been proposing for so long. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is, I mean, if, if there is a mission, I mean, this is our mission. This is our mission with our partners, our friends in Atlas, uh, with the help of Alexandros from uh, on behalf of Atlas, and everyone involved in Atlas and other organizations that can help us. I mean, this is the first mission is to educate the Greek public because there is a great lack of familiarity with uh, free market and libertarian and classical liberal principles. We are, I mean, uh, this is our first target. And then we can persuade some opinion makers and some journalists and uh, some uh, people in the academy and uh, especially students. Yes. Well, we're going to need to, to wrap up, so let me first just to say you know, thank you, Aristides, for a very uh, enlightening presentation, and um, it's a, a very interesting time, and it's, it's a treat to get your first-person perspective on um, what is happening today and how things are going to, to play out. And I'll just say, as, um, as CEO of the Atlas Network, uh, we, we do plan to continue helping our partners in Greece however we can, because we, we want the country to find sustainable solutions to the challenges it faces so it can end this cycle of crises that we've seen. We'd like nothing more than to see Greece become a model of successful reform instead of this cautionary tale that it is today, sort of proving Margaret Thatcher right that uh, you know, socialism works fine until you run out of other people's money. Exactly. We've hit that point today. Um, for those of you on, online, I hope you've enjoyed this call. And if you have, um, I'd like to ask you to go to atlasnetwork.org where you can sign up to receive our bi-weekly World 10 email newsletter. That will keep you informed on the top 10 happenings related to the worldwide freedom movement. 
And while you're there, you can browse the news and analysis section that we have. You'll understand just how remarkable is this world net, uh, worldwide network of pro-liberty partners that we have the privilege of working with. And if you're inspired by what you see there, please make your plans to join us for our annual international conference, the Atlas Liberty Forum, which takes place in New York City, November 11th and 12th this year. And while you're there, uh, consider becoming a donor to Atlas. You'll get more invitations to attend webinars like the one you just enjoyed, and you'll be helping a good cause, as you all know. So thank you again to Aristides Hatsis for a great presentation, and to our own Alexander Spouros for arranging the webinar. And thank you um, to all of you out there for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this webinar brought to you by Atlas Network.